Well, this is my beautiful beauty in her new bed. And you can see just how much she's enjoying that little bed. I don't know if you're familiar with cats, but she's been in there making little puddings, as I call them. You know, where they just move their front their front paws up and down and up and down as though they're making dough or making puddings. So she really loves that. I think she feels very secure in there, you see. Oh, and there's there's my other boy. There's my lovely boy cat. There's Sammy Bear. Sammy Bear the boy cat. He's just had a heap of biscuits. He's got a bed too, but it's in the lodge. Isn't it? I've just spent the past 10 minutes talking absolutely silly to him. He is a bit of a mummy's boy, actually. You know, occasionally you're blessed with a cat with the kind of personality that really, really, really loves to be around humans. And in Sammy's case, dogs as well, because he's very partial to Jack. <laughs> Who wouldn't be partial to Jack? Anyway, this is just a brief little video. I just want to show you a few things out here. Oh, do you know, it's really quite cold. It's quite cold. Now, there's the sun out in a very cloudy sky. And it's sort of shining over that way. And there's a bit of blue sky up there, which is a portent, as they say. It's actually a portent of what's to come. Because tomorrow, and for the few days after that, the weather is going to be gorgeous. I've just heard that. So, what I'm going to do this evening, because it's quite cold, I'm going to make myself a nice cup of tea and a hot water bottle. Yes, I know it's July. On what on earth is this crazy Irish woman doing making a hot water bottle for herself? <coughs> but it's cold. So, and I'm going to curl up in bed with a book. Now, I've been reading a fantastic book. Um, I started reading it a few months ago and I, and I took it up again um, yesterday evening. And um, it's called um, Sapien, you know, as in Homo Sapien. Brilliant book. Thanks so much, Simon, if you're listening to this, because it really is a super, super book. Um, what a journey. What a journey. It's kind of dipping into all kinds of areas of thought and experience in life and sort of pulling all those um you know kind of pulling all those threads together which is it's amazing you know when you read a book and it does that for you so anyway um what i wanted to show you and i've walked past it now but never mind what i'll do is i'll come back to it i wanted to show you the different kinds of budlia that's growing here in the gardens and the conditions in which they're growing. Because, you know they say in permaculture that observation is very important. You should observe how things grow, where things grow, the conditions, etc. And that way you become... Look at that silly cat running up the tree. <laughs> it freaked me out. <laughs> this is a typical Belton Cottage video, okay. We're going to be sidetracked by animals. <laughs> anyway, so about uh, um, observing plants and of how they grow. So <coughs> I'll start with this one around here. So I've got one, two, three, four, five. I think I've got about six different budlias, or probably more than that, grown in the garden. This one here, which is magnificent, as you can see, is growing in two tyres. Now it's become so heavy that I've actually tied it up to the barn there. 
and I haven't pruned it much at all. So that's one. Then this beautiful big white one, which is covered with blossom. I'll walk around this side a little bit. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? That's growing in the earth. And it gets quite a lot of nourishment. See, there's the base of it. Looking up through there. It's incredible, isn't it? So that's different conditions again. This little one, which is very delicate looking, is growing straight out of the gravel. And you can see little flowers are just starting to come on it. Now, with Bootlia, Bootlia, as far as I know, is a shrub that's originally from the Himalayas. And yes, it is the Himalayas and not the Himalayas. I've been listening to Dr. Vandana Shiva, the Himalayas. But these shrubs come from that part of the world, so they are very adept at growing in rocky ground. And in fact, here in Ireland, if you're ever walking about in a town and you look up at the old chimney stacks and the old chimney pots and some of the old Georgian houses and the ones that have been neglected, you will see Budlia growing out of the chimney pots. Look at that silly boy over there. He's like the Cheshire cat from Alice in Wonderland. Look, he's been silly. <laughs> so we walk on down. You see I've been clearing my rustic bed. We'll walk on down the driveway and I'll show you another three. Mm, oh no, I can show you more than three. I can show you another four. Because here we have another one which is growing in a tiny little bit of soil which has just been kind of plunked on top of the gravel. And you can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and there's about eleven stems on it, and that's just beginning to come into flower. And there's the silly cat. Come on, Sammy Bear. Now, going down the driveway, and I'm going to be fairly, fairly quick. I hope anyway. Been a naughty cat. Now, there's two bootlias, one either side, and they're different shades of purple. So I'll just see. Can you see? Can you compare? So this one. Is literally growing out, of the, out from the gravel. It's fairly young. And if you look at the colour, that colour is quite a vivid purple. And then we go down to the next one, which is growing more from the earth, because that's right on the very far edge of the gravel. And the colour in this is different. So I'm thinking that whatever minerals they're drawing up from the earth or from the stone actually gives them their colour. A little bit like hydrangeas, because hydrangeas love to have acid soil and depending on the amount of acidity or alkaline, the, the hydrangeas can range from being quite pink in colour to being incredible shades of blue. Um, I think, I think the blue is from the really acid soil 
and the pink is more acid alkaline obviously weighted for acid because that's what they prefer Sammy Bear has gone into the bank there I'm just going down actually I think I've got more more than another one oh, I've got at least another two down here now all the hydrangeas I have in my garden have been grown from seed now look at this one now you see this one is very lush look how big the flower heads are this is growing in quite boggy even to a certain point wet soil because that's right on the edge of the stream and this is on the flat down here so it's quite boggy so that's really lush and gorgeous it's interesting oh no there's no i don't know how many hydrangeas i have <laughs> look at this one beautiful blooms on this this is growing in gravel it's more gravel perhaps a little bit of acid soil in there on the edge um, and then the final one is this beauty here look it's growing just outside the gate isn't that fabulous Look at that. It's just got the ideal conditions, I think. It's sort of growing in gravel and stony soil, but it's also got enough space in which to develop this wonderful character. Isn't that beautiful? It's a perfect shape. It's a very classic shape. There's like a big cone. Jack, come on, look. Jack and Sammy Bear. Well, there we go. No. I don't know how many bootleys I have. Quite a lot. But anyway, in short, I suppose to summarise, what I'd say is um, bootleys are fantastic shrubs, small trees, to grow in stony soil, in poor soil. They will give you extra blooms if you give them a little bit of a feed. Look at that silly cat and dog, look. Come on, Jack. Sammy. Pshht. Sammy! If I just start walking in now, he might follow. Come on, Jack. This, by the way, is Hebe's. Isn't that lovely? There he's come in now. Oh. Spraying all over the plants. <laughs> Leaving his scent. I don't know if you can hear the lambs up in the hill. Isn't the fuchsia looking fab? So yes, to summarise now with the Bootlia, excellent shrubs, i.e. small trees, for um, ground that's quite poor, stony ground. Um, they appear to be quite fond of lime as well. Um, they don't seem to mind boggy ground as long as they have good drainage. You'll get all different shades of purple depending on where you plant them. And I suppose in terms of their needs, if they can grow out of an old chimney top, they can grow anywhere. <laughs> so that's quite a useful observation I suppose to make. 
They do look lovely, don't they? Just hanging out over the driveway. Now, I'll also show you, when we get to the top of this very hilly drive, <sighs> I think Sammy Bear might have gone into the field next door. Hmm. I'll also show you how easy it is to grow Budlia from seed. And, uh, but out of breath. I suppose the best way to grow it is to try to emulate the conditions that they would naturally grow in, in the Himalayas. So <coughs> the seed likes to germinate in fairly stony soil. So I'll show you where it's germinated quite naturally here. looking to see uh, bear with me I'll find this year's germination there we go so you see just here in the gravel driveway So <clears throat> it's easy then just to gently pull that up from the gravel and pot it on. And it doesn't take long then to turn itself into quite a sturdy shrub. If I was to leave that little one there, it would literally grow like that. And of course the way to collect the seed, because I can show you that as well, it's quite simple. Just put my glasses on here so I can see what I'm doing. Okay, this is seed from last year. Can you see? Little seeds. Now I was selling this seed on my website, but didn't have a lot of takers. And um Probably if I'd put up a video like this, uh, I'd have had a fair few orders for the seed. But basically these flowers are pollinated by bees and wasps and other pollinators. And then um, the flower, all the little flower heads turn into seeds. And then you're left with something like this. But I think these little seed pods are empty because they're from last year. But you get the drift. Of course there's a lot of seeds around at the moment which are well worth collecting and I'll show you here um, on my site I sell a lot of aquilegia which is columbine okay and the columbine uh, is wonderful you can you see all the seeds in there look and you just tip that up like that look and the seeds just fall out so it's that easy to collect the seeds these are wonderful seeds if you want children to grow um, flowers because look, you see, they're quite big, they're quite manageable, all black and shiny. And what I do with them and what I've done with them here at Beltana, I've literally just taken seed and I've just thrown it down into gravel like that. And then you'll find that the acrylagia will come up as it's done there, can you see? 
and you get these beautiful blooms at the time of the year when there aren't a lot of flowers around. So they're very, very important for the bees. Because I will remind you all again that um, when the... I'm not talking about honeybees, okay? I'm talking about wild bees, bumblebees. But when the queen, because it's usually only the queen that survives the winter, when she emerges from hibernation, she has... Roughly speaking, about 40 minutes of food left in her belly. So therefore, she's got about 40 minutes in which to find her first shot of nectar, which is that incredible energy boost. If she doesn't get that within that 40 minutes, she will die. Now you take into consideration the fact that she's just awoken from hibernation. She's flying around. She's probably still a bit disorientated. Um, she's she's searching. Um, it's it could be a cold day, um, so her energy reserves are just being taken up really quickly. You know, it could even be much less than forty minutes. This is just an average we're talking about. So flowers like the aquilegia the columbine, which is a generic name for it, which are flowering at that important time of the year when there's so few blossoms around. The aquilegia, that little seed that I've just thrown down there, can be the difference between life and death for the, for the bee. Now don't forget as well that that little bee is carrying in her belly all the bees in her family for that year. All those eggs that were in her little egg sac last summer were fertilised before she went into hibernation. Do you see how important these flowers are now? Do you understand how important it is to plant flowers and pollinators for the bees? Because if we don't have them around, we become the endangered species, right? We become, we become the victims. So it's very, very important to look after everything within our food um, circle, I suppose. Very important. Very important to collect seed, very important to grow flowers. You know, we're always talking about food, the importance of growing food. You know, can we just step away from the arrogance, please? And start talking about planting food and sowing food for all the other species. Because if they're not there, we're not here. There we go. That's my little sermon over and done with. But you know... I'll be preaching this until the day I die. <laughs> and hopefully I will die in a world that is going to be secure and beautiful for generations to come. It's not a lot to ask, is it? Now this is another little seed here which I'll be collecting soon. And this one is the beautiful Jacob's Ladder. And the bees just adore this. And it's so lovely to watch the bees feasting. And if it wasn't for those little feasting bees, I wouldn't have these beautiful figs. Look at them. Look at the beautiful figs. Nor would I have these beautiful grapes. Look at that. Not to mention all the black currants and the red currants and the the apples and the pears and the plums and all the beautiful, beautiful food. Look at this. So, anyway, there you go. I hope you find that interesting. And I'm going to go in now and make my cup of tea and my hot water bottle and snuggle off into bed and wake up in the morning and hopefully there'll be a blue sky and it'll be warm and gorgeous and I'll be out here in my dressing gown drinking my coffee. <laughs>
crazy Irish lady. Bye everyone.